Hello, folks. This is um, Denise Gabosta at University College Cork in Ireland. Um, there are still some people coming in, but they can continue to come in as I'm giving this introduction. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to this series of seminars sponsored by the European VLBI ne network, focusing on high resolution radio astronomy um, on various topics having to do with very long baseline interferometry. Um, let me mention just a few logistics of the webinar before we begin. You will be muted throughout the presentation, but you're invited to type any questions you may have um, for our speaker through the question and answer facility. You can send in questions both during and after the presentation, but questions will be answered only after the presentation. Please try to write your questions clearly and keep them short. We'll aim to get to as many of your questions as we can, and we apologize in advance if your question is not among those we have time to answer. Um, I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Ivan Marti Vidal. Ivan has carried out research at a number of institutes in Europe, including the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy and the Ansela Space Observatory as a member of the Nordic Alma Re Regional Center. Um, most recently, he's been at the University of Valencia since June 2019. His research covers a wide range of scientific and technical topics related to VLBI, ranging from supernovae to active galactic nuclei and from astrometry to parlimetry. Today, he's going to tell us about tying the sky to the ground. And I'll turn things over to Yvonne now. Thank you, Denise. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind invitation to, to give this, this, uh, this seminar in the EVN seminar. Um, so do you see my screen? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's uh, let's start. So why do I call this uh, this seminar tying the sky to the ground? You will see in a few minutes. Okay, this is what VLBI allows us to do. So we're able to determine observables that uh, allow us to 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 have very very precise estimates of quantities that relate positions on the sky with positions of the radio telescopes on the ground. Okay, as you will see in a few slides. And you will see all the power and all the information that we can extract from this. So this is the scope of the seminar. First, I would like to briefly describe uh, the technique of very long baseline interferometry, which is the technique that we use to do this, these high resolution or high spatial resolution uh, radio astronomical observations. Then we will uh, briefly describe the, the scientific interest behind this, this technique. Or why do we need this very high resolution and very high precision to determine antenna locations and source positions on the sky. Then we will turn a little bit more technical, okay, and, and talk about the VLBI observable. So what do we actually observe when we do VLBI, okay? And how do we extract the information that we, that, uh, that we need to extract from the, from the VLBI observables? We will then describe analysis techniques, okay, very, very briefly. So I will try to be as generic as possible, okay, to try to be, yeah, clear for even for non-radio astronomers. You will tell me afterwards if I if I succeeded in this in this in this um, in this goal. And then, last but not least, we will talk a little bit about what's coming next, okay, regarding VLBI geodesy, so the so-called uh, uh, global VLBI observing system or VLBI global observing system. We will see. So let's start from the beginning, okay? Let's uh, discuss a little bit about VLBI. So all the story begins because of what we call um, um, what we call uh, diffraction limit, okay? So we need optical aperture in astronomy. Okay, what is optical aperture? Well, it comes from the diffraction limit, okay? Diffraction limit basically tells us that if you have a, a source and you observe that source, with a telescope, okay, then the image that you get, that you obtain of that source is not the exact representation of the source, okay? It's not an infinitely sharp image of the source, it's blurred, okay? So every telescope and actually every optical device, what it does is to blur the images of the sources that we observe, okay? And this blurring depends on the uh, wavelength at which we are observing, okay? So the longer the wavelength, the, uh, the stronger this blurring is, okay? The level of blurring also depends on the size of the telescope. So if your telescope is small, uh, it, it regardless of the wavelength, your images will be more, more blurred, okay? If you want to have sharper images, you need to have 
uh, larger telescopes, and you need to observe at shorter wavelengths, okay? So both things combined. In radio astronomy, we have a problem, okay? Because radio wavelengths have, uh, have uh, lambdas have, have uh, uh, wavelengths that are much, much, much longer, orders of magnitudes longer than those in the optical, which means that if you want to observe a sharp image of a radio source in the sky, you need a telescope to be thousands of times uh, larger than an optical telescope, which means telescopes, you need telescopes uh, with sizes of kilometers. <laughs> but this is not very practical, okay? If your telescope, you can build large radio telescopes, of course, nothing prevents you from that. You just need a, a good uh, budget to do it. But if the telescopes get too big, then you have other problems, okay? <laughs> Which are not related to budget, but the structure itself may collapse, okay? If the telescope is too big. Okay, so you need some uh, a smart approach yeah, to, to get uh, optical aperture, to get uh, effective size of your radio telescope, okay, without the danger to, <laughs> for the structure to collapse, okay, if you build it too big. So fortunately, we have a technique, a very smart technique that overcomes this uh, diffraction limit without the need of having to build very large, gigantic telescopes, okay? This technique is called interferometry. And what interferometry does is to combine signals arri that arrive to different, much smaller radio telescopes, and it combines these signals in such a way that we are able to synthesize or to simulate a telescope as large as the maximum distance between the smaller dishes that are being combined, okay? This is the magic of interferometry. And this allows us to build uh, radio telescopes or, well, synthetic radio telescopes as large as we want or as large as we can, okay? We can even build radio telescopes as big as the whole planet Earth, okay? Just by combining signals that arrive to different telescopes spread across the surface of the planet, okay? So this would be like the synthetic telescope that we would generate if we would apply this technique. This is called very long baseline interferometry, which means interferometry applied to intercontinental baselines, okay? Uh, radio telescopes are spread across the whole planet, okay? This is VLBI. So how does interferometry work? Well, it's relatively simple to understand, but as I always say, the devil is in the details, okay? But yeah, briefly, to keep it, uh, to keep it simple, to keep it simple, if you have a, a, an ordinary telescope, okay, how does it work? Well, the signal is basically coming from the outer space, okay? Here you have a beautiful front wave coming from the stars, and it enters the, the, the lens of the telescope. And what this, what this lens does is to focus the front wave into an image, okay? This is what the lens does, okay? The objective, the aperture of the telescope, okay? It makes this uh, front wave to converge into one image. When you have an interferometer, you do a slightly different thing. Instead of uh, letting the, the, the front wave pass through a lens, you record the front wave. You record the front wave in different points of a space. And what you do is to apply a computer lens. So once you have your front wave recorded in your computers, you make like a, you build like a virtual lens, a lens made in a computer. And this lens basically converges the front wave that you have recorded into an image. So you have like a virtual lens or a computer lens, okay, instead of a physical one. Okay, these two operations, okay, the, the one performed by a physical lens and the one performed by a computer lens is, oops, is a Fourier transform. Okay, so Fourier transform is what makes the front wave to turn into an image. Or, well, uh, uh, seeing it in a, in a different way. So a lens, a lens, like the ones you have in your glasses or in a telescope, is a, like an analog machine of computing Fourier transforms, okay? This is what the computer is doing in the case of the interferometer. It's just the Fourier transform of the front wave. Okay, so here's the expression of the Fourier transform. So don't be scared. We, we, we will not, we will just take a, a look at it once, which is in this slide, okay? So don't be too scared about it. Just. Uh, to give you the meaning of all these different colors here. So in blue, I show you the observable, what we observe in VLBI, which is called visibility. Well, not in VLBI, but in interferometry in general, we observe visibilities, which have to do with the correlation of the signal that arrived to the different antennas. Okay, and this visibility is equal to this huge expression here, which is basically an integral, okay? An integral of the source structure or source brightness distribution so the shape of the source on the sky, okay, multiplied by this factor, okay, which is a complex number. And the phase of this complex number has, uh, is determined by these quantities here. This B is what we call the baseline, is the vector 
that unites the, 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 the two telescopes from which we are computing the visibility, okay? So this baseline is the relative position of one of the telescopes with respect to the other, okay? IK is just the levels of the telescopes here. S is the direction toward the source, okay? So it's the location on the sky where the source, uh, where the observed source is, is, uh, is uh, placed, okay? So this S points towards the source. And as you can see, well, what we, uh, with this exponential depends on the product of these two things. So the baseline on the one hand, which basically tells us about where are the telescopes located or where is, uh, where is one telescope with respect to the other, and S, which tells us where is the source being observed. And we observe, well, well we measure the product of both, okay? If the source is very compact, okay, which means that we, we could approximate it like a, well, like the mathematicians would say, a Dirac delta, okay, then the integral disappears, okay, and then this becomes basically the, the phase of the visibility, okay? I will not talk, I come into much detail here. I, I wouldn't like to, to dedicate too much time to this, but for, just for you to know that if the source is compact or if we can subtract the, the, the structure effect from the visibilities, so that the only remaining thing in the phase is this quantity, then it means that if we are able to measure this quantity, we are able to measure this quantity, then we have an estimate of this tau here. What is tau, Ivan, you will ask? Okay, tau, look at the geometry of the interferometer here. Here you have the baseline vector, here you have the source vector, and well, you're using some high school mathematics, you will see that the, the, this product of baseline times S is just the length of this segment here which is the delay, okay, the time that light needs to uh, arrive to this antenna I once it has arrived to this antenna K. So it's the delay between the signal arriving at both antennas, okay? This tau is the time that light needs to arrive to antenna I once it has arrived to antenna K. And this delay, as you can see here, this delay encodes information of both things. So the baseline, so where are the telescopes? And S, which is where is the source? Okay, we are measuring two things with this delay. Okay, how do we use this delay? Now, now in the next slides, we are gonna exploit a little bit this product of uh, uh, baseline times S. Okay, so again, what we measure is this product. Let me insist on this. This is the mantra, okay? One of the mantras I would like to, to insist in this talk. We are measuring this product with a very high precision, extremely high precision. We can have precision even of picoseconds. So, so a picoseconds is 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Imagine that. So it's a very, very high precision. But what we get is a precision in the product, okay? Not a precision for each one of these two things independently, a precision for the product, okay? And this product encodes information of both things. On the one hand, we have the baseline, which encodes information, as I have told you several times now, of the relative antenna positions. And this allows us to do what we call geodesy, which is the study of the shape of the earth and how it moves, how it, uh, how it is oriented with respect to the rest of the universe, okay? How are we moving actually with the earth, okay? VLBI is actually the only technique that is able to fully provide the whole set of observables that allow us to define this, uh, what is called the International Celestial Reference Frame and the international terrestrial reference frame. So it is basically the shape and the orientation of the Earth, absolute orientation with respect to the universe, with respect to the set of very distant quasars, okay? And this is very important. This is crucial to study how the Earth works, okay? How the innermost part of the Earth is affecting the, the, the crust, okay? And how, uh, how the orientation of the planet is changing because of all these forces inside our planet, okay? which we call the Earth Orientation Parameters, EOP. So this is, uh, this is for geodesists, okay? And for astronomers, we have the other thing, we have S, okay? S allows us or encodes information about relative source locations on the sky. And this allows us to study proper motions with a very, very high precision. I'm talking about precisions of micro arc seconds per year, which is uh, the, the, the speed at which, at which human hair rises as seen from the moon. So imagine an, astro an astronaut on the moon, okay, if, if the astronaut would have the position to disentangle micro seconds per year motions, that astronauts would be able to see, to detect how our hair here on Earth is growing in real time. So let's imagine, this is a micro second per year. This is the precision for improper motions that we can achieve if we have a good estimate of S. But again, what we have is a product of both. 
So this is what gives, uh, gives uh, the title to this seminar, okay? So this is what ties the sky to the ground, okay? The possibility of measuring this product with extremely high precision, okay? So again, for B, if you have B, you have access to all this information, okay? This is a sketch, a very nice sketch by, by Chao that tries to show you all the different uh, uh, effects that are affecting the shape and the motion of the earth and how it is oriented with respect to the sky, okay? You have effects from earthquakes, from the weight of the, of the ice that was melting after the last ice age. You have effects from volcanoes. We have the, the crustal, the crustal motions. You have winds. We have the weight of the sea and the exchange of angular momentum between the current of the sea and the earth. So how the sea and how the current of the oceans affects the rotation of the earth. It's amazing that we can measure such a thing. Okay? It's amazing. And here I show you real results, okay? This is, this is real um, observations, okay? Um, the, the scale here, it's two centimeters per year, the length of this arrow. And here I show you from Whitney et al, 2014, mm -hmm. how several geodetic stations are moving with respect to each other. So again, Wegener uh, hypothesis of the crash motion is not an hypothesis anymore, it's a fact. We have directly measured how the continents are drifting apart one from the other. This is direct measurement from VLBI. It's amazing. So from the side of S, okay, we are able to study, uh, we have access to these uh, very precise proper motions. Uh, we, have, we can study, but, well, main sources that we're observing with VLBI are, are supermassive black holes, okay? And actually radio emission coming from supermassive black holes, which is likely uh, coming from what we call uh, uh, relativistic outflows, okay? This is the sketch of a black hole where you have an accretion disk, material is, is spinning down uh, to the black hole and all the material is not, is not swallowed by the black hole. A fraction of it, small fraction of it escapes from the black hole in very energetic jet streams, okay? Which are, uh, well, likely related to the presence of uh, strong magnetic fields, okay? And then matter is propagating downstream. In this sketch, I have used these, uh, these uh, different colors and different places of the jet as, as a way to, yeah, to to show you that this, the, these jet structures uh, are chromatic in the sense that uh, the shape that, well, the images that you obtain when you observe black holes depend on the observing frequency. If you observe at low frequencies, you get information from here, far away from the black hole. If you observe at higher and higher and higher and higher frequencies, you get images of structures more and more and more and more close to the black hole, okay? So the, the, the location at which you obtain your image depends on the observing frequency. And once you obtain this information, once you obtain how the, the location of your image depends on, uh, on frequency, this is real data of uh, Galaxy M87 obtained by Hada et al. You see how beautifully the location of the emission depends on observing frequency. This is frequency and this is offset of the peak of emission uh, as, uh, as, uh, as reference to a given point on the sky. Then you can obtain very valuable information about the physical conditions in, the, in these uh, streams of, uh, of relativistic matter. And you can learn how this black hole works, okay? So how, how matter is being expelled and which mechanisms are, are taking place in this, in this uh, relativistic phenomenon. So there's a lot to learn from, okay? So this is the kind of information we obtain from these two things that are directly, well, uh, observable with, with VLBR, or at least the product of them is directly observable. Okay, so how we obtain this information, how we measure this delay between the antennas, which is B times S. There are different ways to do that, okay? There are different observables, what we call observables, different ways of measuring this. So the same quantity, B times S, can be obtained either as, we, as what we call phase delay, which is basically turning a phase into a delay by dividing by, by the frequency. It's, it's high school maths, okay? It's just dividing by the frequency, so you get the, the, the time, okay? So you divide a phase by frequency, you get time. This is a very precise observable. Actually, this is the most precise observable that we can have in VLBI. There's nothing more precise than this, the phase, the phase delay. The problem with this observable is that it's, an, it's, it's ambiguous, okay? With the, and this is due to the fact that zero degrees is exactly the same phase as 360 degrees. And 360 degrees is exactly the same phase at 720 degrees. So you always have an ambiguity of two pi radians of 360 degrees. And this ambiguity makes these observables ambiguous as well. It's a problem. This is a real big problem <laughs> that this observable has. 
It's very precise, but it's very problematic because of these ambiguities of phase. Another observable, which is less precise than the phase delay, but it's much more practical because it's yeah, more or less not ambiguous, okay? I will not enter into, into details here, is the group delay, which is defined as the slope of the phase as a function of frequency, okay? Um, this is less precise if the bandwidth of observation is this, the, the, the total frequency coverage of your receiver is much lower than the observing frequency, okay? There are ways of trying to overcome this. I will tell you at the end of the talk if we have time. So, okay, the group delay is more practical, it's more robust, but it's, it's less precise. And last but not least, we have the delay rate, which is uh, defined as the, the rate at which uh, the delay or the phase is changing with time. It's the least precise of these observables, okay? Three ways, three different ways of measuring or trying to measure the same thing, okay? For you to have a, a, an idea of the order of magnitude of the, of the, of the precision with the, these, these different quantities, let us propose one, um, one um, mental experiment where we are observing at this typical frequency for VLBI with this typical bandwidth in VLBI and the typical scan duration of, let's say, one minute, okay? This is a typical scan that we could have in VLBI. With a phase noise of, let's say, 10 degrees. So we have a, yeah, a source which is not very, very, very uh, strong, okay? So we have some noise here. This would be the uncertainties that we will have in each one of these three observables. So imagine, in, for the phase delay, you have 12 picoseconds, 0.012 nanoseconds. For you to remember, a nanosecond is a billionth of a second, okay? Remember, this is the precision in the delay uh, between signals arriving at telescopes that can be located at different continents across the Earth. It's amazing that we can measure such a thing with such a high precision, isn't it? So the group delay would have a precision uh, which is, yeah, more than or an order of magnitude less than that of the phase delay. And well, you, we can, you, you can forget about high precision with the rates. It still has some precision, but it's nothing compared to the, to the group and phase delays. So this is just to have an idea, okay, of, of the relative quantities we are dealing with. I would say that the takeaway message of this slide is that, well, using phase delays in VLBI rocks. So we, we should try to use phase delays as much as we can because these are the real precise, the really precise quantities. But it is tricky, it is very tricky to, to deal with these two pi ambiguities in the phases. We need ways to solve for this. And there are ways, okay? Fortunately, there are different strategies, different tools that we can use to try to overcome this limitation. So in the, in the next slides, I will try to explain, uh, not in much detail, I hope, okay? But clearly enough, how can we exploit the phases in VLBI extrometry? How, how the tools that we have developed or, or that has been developed, okay? The set of tools that has been developed to try to overcome this limitation. Okay, so yeah, let's come back to the main problem. Okay, the problem of the phase delay is the two pi ambiguities. As I just told you, there are different ways to deal with them, and all these methods make use of what we call differential observables, okay? Ivan, what is a differential observable in the case of the phase delay? Let me explain to you. Okay, let's observe, let's see that we are observing uh, a source, let's call this source A, source A, okay? At a given time, T. Okay, so for a given baseline, oh, sorry, for a given baseline, this would be the delay that we would observe, okay? so. The baseline between the two antennas at times t, because the Earth is rotating, okay, times the vector that points toward the source, plus some effects that are instrumental. We don't care about them, okay? Don't pay much attention to it. Then we observe another source, source B, at a time t uh, prime, okay? It's slightly different than time t. Okay, this is what we observe for source B, okay? So the same product for, uh, for uh, the baseline at times t prime times SB, plus instrumental effects. Now, the point of differential observables is that if the sources A and B are close in the sky, are close by, so the two vectors point roughly to the same region of the sky, and the observing times are similar, so, so I observe maybe in a one minute and in a couple of minutes time from one to the other, okay, then these two things are very similar, and then we can define what we call the differential delay as the difference of delays, okay, between source B and source A which is this, okay? And if time is, is, uh, is uh, close enough and the sources are close enough, we can get rid of most of the instrumental effects and then this will be free of two pi ambiguities and of instrumental effects. So this is a very robust, a very, very robust observable, differential delays, okay? So ways to exploit these differential delays, there are several, several strategies. 
The most tricky one is uh, phase connection, which is described, for instance, in Guidado 2000. There are many other papers talking about it, which what does is to try to track the evolution of the ambiguities, try to figure the ambiguities out from the observations themselves. Okay, it's a little bit tricky. I'll tell you, it's tricky. Okay, the other one, which is uh, which is much more practical, it's because you basically don't care about the two pi ambiguities, is to use phase reference. What phase referencing does is to do to use these phases or these delays to do imaging, to image sources. When you do imaging, the ambiguities do not matter anymore. You, what, the only thing you care about is the phase. You don't care about the phase delay, so you don't care about the, the ambiguities. Okay, The images don't depend on these two pi ambiguities. And this gives a lot of power to this technique. You don't have to track ambiguities anymore. You just measure the phases and that's it, okay? There are different approaches to do phase referencing, okay? It's a pretty old technique, but it is still today, we are, we are <laughs> developing more and more refinements of this technique, okay? You can do, phase, for instance, phase referencing between different sources at the same frequency. This is shown in these very old papers here, but it's still, it still rocks, okay? It's still very much used in, in, in current observations. You can also do phase referencing uh, between the same source, or between different sources at different frequencies. You can do phase referencing between frequencies. Okay, it's a very, very nice and smart technique by Middlemerk, 2002. Or you can do combinations of all the above, which is very, very uh, well elaborated uh, methods developed by, by Rioja and Dodson, okay, and, 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 and others. So let's me, let, let me just show you some results of these two uh, big families of, uh, of algorithms, okay? I'm just showing results. First, about phase connection. So why would we care to do ambiguity connection? And, and uh, why, why don't we just do phase referencing imaging? Why do we have to care of these two pi ambiguities? Well, it has its advantages. If you are able to disentangle the two pi ambiguities, then the precision gets boosted. You get much more precision than with mere phase referencing. Okay, this, and just to, to show you an example, this is a set of sources that we call the S5 polar cap sample. It's a set of uh, supermassive black holes which emit in radio, and they are located close to the North Celestial Pole. So this thing here is the North Celestial Pole. So Polaris, polar star would be around here, okay? And these sources are distributed across the polar cap, okay? And across the North polar cap of the sky, with separations up to 21 degrees. So it's very, very huge uh, uh, cap of the or, or portion of the sky. Uh, so these there, there are observations of this polar cap sample made uh, to perform this phase connection uh, technique, okay? Uh, especially at 15 gigahertz, where we could actually solve using a, uh, an automatic phase connection algorithm. I, I don't want to talk about it in too much detail, just to show you the results. And this, this, this plot is beautiful. I really love this figure. So what you see here is for a given baseline, okay, this is a pair of antennas, Hancock, and Kitt Peak, which are located in continental US and are separated by 3,600 kilometers. So this is the distance between these two antennas, Hancock and Peak, Kitt Peak. And here I show you the residual delay. So what, what remains to be fitted after all this modeling, okay? This is the residual delays for among all the different sources. So different sources are shown in different colors. And as you can see, the residuals are very similar for the different sources. This tells us that this, this, uh, this differential delay is very robust, okay? It's basically independent of the, of the instrumentation and the atmosphere, which would be producing this dancing of the data as a function of time. So different sources have very similar residuals. And actually we could get, this is amazing, we could get a precision of two picoseconds. So picoseconds, two times 10 to the minus 12, okay? Seconds of residual delays for baselines that are separated by thousands of kilometers. So this is, let's say, the, all the power of this phase connection approach, which can be even applied at even higher frequencies, 43 gigahertz, which is still gives you even higher precision for the astrometry. Here I show you some results published in 2018, where you can see the residuals. This is picoseconds. Pay attention. This is 20 and minus 20 picoseconds. And the residuals are all of them within this uh, tiny window of delay. And the, and, the, and the differential delays, which is the difference between the different sources, is basically zero. So it's 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 a very very a very very precise technique. But it's very problematic, as I have told you, because you have the problem of, of trying to yeah to derive these two pi ambiguities from the data, which is tricky. Okay, what about phase referencing, which is the 
let's let's call it easier approach or more direct approach because you forget about the ambiguities. So there are different uh, uh, different um, ways to apply phase referencing. The first one, which is the oldest one, is to do it among sources or between different sources. Okay, so basically you are uh, using this observable or you are deriving, sorry, this observable, which is the difference between the source position A and the source position B. You refer one source to the other. Okay. And this technique is very powerful unless, unless the sources are very far away or the atmosphere is wild, okay? If the atmosphere is so wild that it's very different for source A and source B, then the technique is very problematic, okay? Or can be, can be limited. And actually here I show you some, some statistical analysis that was done on a, on a set of sources, okay? Where what I show you here is what we call dynamic range, which is basically the quality of, uh, of phase referencing. So this quantity is basically quality of, of phase referencing as a function of separation between the two sources that are being calibrated one to the other, okay? As you can see, there is a strong limitation in the quality of phase referencing as we move farther and farther away one source from the other, okay? Here at left, I show you a phase referencing image of a source, okay? Uh, it's a quasar reference to a distant source. So it's very, very noisy. You see here a lot of artifacts here that are limiting the quality of the image. And here I show you the very same image, so, sorry, the very same data. So here at right, you have the very same data, but calibrated not using phase referencing, calibrated using uh, what we call self-cal, okay? Which, is, which brings uh, the whole power of the observations, okay? Uh, here it's uh, the best possible image you can have from this data. And as you can see, the difference is very clear, okay? Phase referencing limits a lot the quality of the image reconstruction because of the atmosphere, okay? The farther away the, the one source is from the other, calibrated on the target, the less the, or the, the lower is the, the quality, okay? Here you have the same numbers, quality, so the same, uh, yeah, same quantity, okay? Uh, for the case of the images not phase referenced. And as you can see, well, we can reach dynamic ranges of tens of thousands instead of just hundreds, okay, when you don't apply phase referencing. There are ways to try to overcome this limitation. One of them is, for instance, using different calibrators and trying to use the different sources to try to build a map of the atmosphere structure. If you have a cloud and you observe different sources, then you can let's say, make an image of that cloud or, 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 or study in a statistical way how that cloud may affect the source that you want to calibrate, okay? This was developed by, by Rioja et al., okay? And here I show you very nice results of the phases calibrated using different calibrators located at different distances from the target. So this is the target. And these different colors are different calibrators, okay? If you use cali the calibrator separately to calibrate the target, the calibration is not of high quality, okay? It is very noisy. But if you combine all of them in such a way that you try to make a, a map of the structure of the atmosphere and then interpolate that here, then the quality of the interpolation, which is the black points, improves a lot. So this is one uh, very smart trick to try to overcome these atmospheric limitations. Another other approaches exists. For instance, the, what we call the troposphere map, mapping is just observing at different elevations and trying to figure out what's the, what's the value of the tropospheric delay or the atmosphere delay. Here is a, this is a very nice publication by Brunhaler et al. 2005, where it shows you how the quality of the phase referencing depends on the, on the different strategies that you can, that you can apply okay, to, to try to improve this phase referencing. Okay, what about doing phase referencing between different frequencies? That's another possibility. And this actually is very powerful because, because it would allow us uh, when we, if we study black holes, it would allow us to, 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 to uh, construct, to reconstruct the chromatic structure of these outflows, of these jets of relativistic matter, okay? So it's, very, it's a very interesting technique from the point of view of, of radio astronomy, okay? The, the, there's this interfrequency phase referencing. The problem is that we, has, we have to deal with the ionosphere that introduces the delays that depend on frequency, and it's very tricky, okay? Here I show you the first image the first VLBI image that was obtained using this interfrequency phase referencing, it was in 2002. And the quality of the image was very much limited because of the effects of this ionosphere, okay? The ionosphere is making lots of trouble when you want to apply this kind of calibration between frequencies. There are much smarter ways to do this, like for instance, observing at very different frequencies so that we can track this, this, uh, this um, yeah, new to the minus two effects, okay? And solve for them. Okay, and once you solve for them, then you can apply them to your data. You have them as a function of time 
for each antenna, you solve the ionosphere above each antenna and for each time, okay, you solve for it. When you solve for it, you apply it, and then you have a very beautiful image of your source at different frequencies, okay? This is very powerful technique, which uh, still hasn't been exploited enough, I would say. So it's, there's lots of possibilities of this technique, okay, to study, especially to study AGN, to study actic galactic nuclei, supermassive black holes. Here I show you another example where this technique was applied. It was in Marti Vidal 2017, where we actually applied two completely different approaches to determine this, these shifts or chromatic shifts of AGN jets, okay? And here I show you in, in contours and in crosses, the results from these very different, completely independent approaches. And we got compatible results. This was like a, what we call in Spain, la prueba del algodón, so which is the gold, the gold proof that the technique was working, okay? This, because we were using two different, completely independent approaches and we were getting compatible results. So we could actually study this to, to this, so, well, to reconstruct how these uh, AGN jets depend on frequency, okay? And then obtain physical information about, about the, the conditions in these jets. Uh, another example where this, where this calibration is applied is for instance, the KVN, the Korean VLBI network, which can observe at much higher frequencies, even at 129 gigahertz, okay? And we can calibrate this data, which are much more noisy, using data at lower frequencies, which is much less noisy, is much of much higher quality. We, you use, we use these frequencies to calibrate this one, okay? And then we can obtain images, as you can see here in this publication from Algaba 2014, where you can see the reconstructions, well, the image reconstructions at 129 gigahertz. It's amazing that VLBI can work at such high frequencies and it can work even at higher frequencies, okay? It's, it's, it's amazing what we can do with today's, today's uh, uh, today's uh, radio astronomical devices. It's amazing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the future of VLBI geodesy. Uh, or at least, well, my, my, my vision of the future. Of, uh, the future is much wider than what I'm going to show you now. Okay, as I have just, well, I ha as I have told you a few minutes ago, and as you may remember, the group delay is not as precise as the phase delay. Okay, the phase delay is the most precise observable we have. The problem of the phase delay, as you may remember, is these two pi ambiguities, which makes it very tricky to, to use in, uh, in, uh, in VLBI analysis. And the group delay is not ambiguous, it's very, very robust, okay? But yeah, the only thing that makes the group delay to not be as precise as the phase delay is the fact that the bandwidth of our radio astronomical receivers is much, or used to be much narrower than the actual observing frequency. So the ratio between the precisions goes roughly as the ratio between the bandwidth and the observing frequency. But nowadays, nowadays, we are able to build receivers. And for this, for instance, uh, Yebes, Observatory, Yebes Observatory, where I have been working a few months in 2019, they are, they are real experts in this, in the, in the design of this kind of receivers that have a ultra wide bandwidth. Bandwidth such that the actual bandwidth is similar to the observing frequency. So you have roughly 100% of relative bandwidth. It's amazing, that means, that if you can use such receivers in VLBI, then the group delay will become as precise as the phase delay, okay? And you will have all the precision of the phase delays with all the advantages of the group delays. This is the dream of VLBI astrometry and geodesy, okay? This is the dream. And the dream is possible. Nowadays, it's possible. We have the receivers, okay? And the only thing we need is to develop the proper technique to do this, okay? There are several challenges with this strategy. Of course, things are not easy. <laughs> One of them is the instrumental. We need ultra, -wi ultra wideband receivers that coherently observe across all this, all this wideband. It's very tricky to, to have this and to have this in a stable way, to, to, to re receivers to remain stable across the, the whole set of observations. It's very tricky. Source related, we also have problems which are source related. The AGM images, the jets, the images of the jets depend on frequency, okay? We have this chromatic uh, structure of the uh, relativistic outflows. We, and we are observing all this chromaticity together in one single observation. We need ways to model this from this observation. And it's very tricky. It's very tricky, mathematically tricky to take all this into account. And last but not least, we also have other effects that I will not mention in detail, but have to do with the limitations in the instrumentation that has such wide bandwidths, okay? 
Um, well, the takeaway message of these limitations is that we need to perform what we call spectropolarimetry of the sources. So we need to know how the sources behave, not only as a function of frequency, but also in polarization. And it's very tricky. Okay, We are still developing tools to do this. Okay, So it's not a, a solved problem. Okay, The problem is still not solved. And we are actually now, currently, developing methods to do this. Okay, So the, let's say the main or the most important uh, project that nowadays wants to exploit these ultra wideband receivers for geodesy and astrometry is the so-called VLBI Global Observing System, VGOS, okay? And in the next slides, I'm going to show you a few results about a subset of VGOS antennas, okay? What we call European VGOS, okay? So first VGOS in general, so it, uh, it's a a global project, okay, to do geometry, uh, sorry, geodesy with a one millimeter precision. So imagine we will be able to know the relative positions between telescopes separated by thousands of kilometers with a precision of one millimeter. It's amazing what we, can, what we will be able to do with such a precision. The level of details at which we are able to study the motion of the earth, how the shape and the orientation of the earth is changing almost in real time, okay? Earth orientation parameters continuously monitored. Okay, so 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week. Frequency coverage spaced between two and 14 gigahertz. So it's a relative wide, width, uh, wide uh, bandwidth, sorry, of the order of 100%. And well, and, and uh, there are now uh, correlations performed at Haystack Observatory and MIT, and also for the European site in Bonn, in the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. So let me now briefly talk to you about uh, the European or the subset of European stations that a few years ago we started to, to have a common project coordinated by the Max Planck Institute to try to perform astrometry in a way more independent of uh, the approaches followed in Hestac MIT. Okay, so this is the so they called European Vigos. Okay. Uh, currently they are performing some uh, four-hour sessions uh, between two, three stations so far. Okay, on Salavets Langeves in Spain. Uh, okay, there, I was working there in 2019 where we obtained the results that I I'm going to show you in the next slides. Okay, these are the three antennas being involved in the observation that I'm just going to show you. This is amazing what I'm showing you here. I, I was very happy when I obtained these plots. It was, it was uh, uh, sitting in an, in an office there at Jeves. I, I couldn't resist to show, to show this to everybody there because it was so fun, so, so amazing. What I'm showing you here, ladies and gentlemen, it's the phases, the delays and the rates across the band that goes between two gigahertz and, tw and 11 gigahertz. So we have between two and 11 gigahertz, we have a coherent phase delay, uh, phase uh, delay and rate across the whole band, okay? This is for a selection of a scans of a, of a calibrator source, 3C84. And as you can see, the phases that we are getting, this is phase as a function of frequency, they are connecting very well one to the other among the different bands. It's amazing, okay? You can even see uh, ionospheric effects here, okay? As a, because this basically telling us that the phase is moving faster as the, as the frequency goes lower, which is a typical effect of the ionosphere. So we can even start to see ionospheric effects directly from the delay rates of, of these AOVGOS observations. It's amazing. From these very same observations, we were even actually able to reconstruct an image of a source, okay? So this is made with just three antennas, three European, the three European VIGOS antennas between six and 12 gigahertz. And we were able to reconstruct the image of an AGN, okay? Source 3C279, which at milli arc second scales, very tiny scales has a jet that points in this direction, okay? This is at seven millimeters, 43 gigahertz. And as you can see here, we have, well, in red, you have what would be the jet extension, which is roughly in the same direction, goes in the same direction as the actual jet that we know this source has, okay? Which, that's very good to recover a jet that goes in the same direction where it should be, okay? And we also recovered the polarimetry. This is this uh, green uh, lines here are the polarization, represent the polarization angle of the radiation coming from the, from the jet of this AGN, okay? And as you can see, it also goes in a direction similar to what we have or we obtain at, at higher frequencies. This is a, well, it's, it's very important result in my opinion. It's the first image that you obtain from a VIGOS observation. 
And it's actually very encouraging that we are getting results that are compatible to what we actually know about this source. So uh, finishing, I'm, I, I think I actually ran out of time. So astronomical interferometry, and in particular VLB, allows us to synthesize virtual telescopes as large as the whole planet Earth, OK? The main observables, which are the visibilities, allow us to, to, to derive or to measure with a very high, extremely high precision, the product of these two quantities. And each one of these two quantities encodes information about either the antenna locations or the locations of the observed sources. And we get the product of both, OK? And then we, we well, there are lots of methods being developed and already developed in VLBI that allow us to disentangle one quantity from the other and then derive information, very precise information of both the ground and the sky. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan. Okay, let's see. Okay, we've got some um, questions coming in. Uh, with Vigos, the antenna size is 13.2 meters. With a smaller antenna size, the sensitivity decreases. Yeah. So how good will the Vigos sessions be for astronometry and as astronomy applications? Are there any significant astronomy applications from uh, that you can do using a 13.2 meter Vigos radio telescope? That's a very good question. And actually, you have a much smaller antennas, that's true but you also have a much wider bandwidth. So if you are able to do what we call multi-frequency synthesis, if you are able to use all the data together to build an image of the source covering the whole band, that means that you also have an extra sensitivity that comes from the width of your receiver. Of course, you, are, you will not be able to, do, uh, to observe sources as weak as the sources we typically observe with the EVN, but for the, for the strong calibrators, you can actually do in very interesting science with, with, with Vigos. And actually it would be like a byproduct because Vigos will need to have images of the sources to derive the, the, the geodetic observables with the one millimeter precisions that we want to observe, okay? And that means that we could use eventually these images to do astronomy. Uh, astronomy. Okay, thank you. Um, another a comment and question. Thanks, Ivan, for a great talk. How critical is it becoming for Vigos to have um, a good initial image of the astronomical sources used as reference sources? Because at those resolutions, many will probably show structure. Well, that's, a, that's a, an excellent question. I, I would say that, well, based on, on my, uh, my limited experience with the EU Vigos observations, uh, it's, it's equally important to have a, a, a model of the source as to have a model of the chromaticity of the source. So how the source is structured and how the source location, what we call the core of the AGN, depends on frequency. Because in the end, what you are doing when you do your fringe fitting is to fit the whole band between 2 gigahertz and 11 gigahertz together. So okay, this allows you to, to, have a, to, yeah, to derive a good model of the ionosphere on the one hand, but you also need a good model of the source chromaticity on the other hand. Otherwise, you will, you will, uh, you will yeah, decrease a lot the quality of your, of your geodetic observables. Okay. Yeah, it's critical. Yeah, the short ans answer is yes, it's critical. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. Okay, um, again, thanks for uh, the nice talk. Is it possible to say which of the phase delay approaches is most economical in terms of observation time if your research objective is good astrometry? If you want to do good astrometry, I think that the most uh, sensible approach would be to perform phase referencing using, using uh, yes, let's say more elaborated approaches. So not the classical one that would use only one target source, for instance, or just one frequency, I would, I, would, uh, I would advise to use a more elaborated way of doing phase referencing. Because with phase referencing, you forget about the two pi cycles. And believe me, it's a big relief because it's a real problem to deal with all these two pi ambiguities. It's very easy to just have one of them and you don't realize you have it. And it's biasing all your observables. It's very tricky. But if you want to get rid of the limitations or the main limitations of phase referencing, then you need more elaborated approaches. Like for instance, this, the one here that I just showed you, which uses several, several uh, calibrator sources, which is this one by, by Rioja et al, that uses several calibrators around the source so that you can interpolate 
the, 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 the atmosphere there at the location of the source. And then you would have also the possibility to do triangulation. So to do triangulation in your astrometry and get a lot of extra precision uh, and in, your, in, the, in your estimates of the relative positions. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for you myself as well. Um, I can remember being in, I think eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade in my, in my school. And in seventh grade, we were taught about the, um, the theory of continental drift. And in eighth grade, we were told that it was no longer theory, it was fact. And although I didn't know it at the time, given the, given the time frame, which is sort of the mid 1970s, um, I, I now assume that what happened was that some early geodetic BLBI experiments were done that actually first showed that the continents were actually moving in the way predicted by the theory. Which yeah, is, indeed. is a great thing to think back on. Um, and the funny thing is, of course, I probably even know now some of the people who were doing those early measurements. But my question for you is, it was a great theory, this continental drift, and it could explain a lot of things, but would there have been any way to test it if we didn't have VLBI? Or is VLBI the only way to test that, that theory? Good question. So uh, nowadays we have GPS stations which are able to give us uh, with high precision relative locations uh, among the different geodetic stations that use GPS receivers. The problem with GPS or the main limitation of the GPS is that it doesn't allow us to know the absolute orientation of the earth with respect to space, okay? So it would be possible to measure continental drift, actually it is possible <laughs> as far as I know, to measure continental drifts using GPS receivers, but what GPS are still unable to give us is the Earth orientation parameters, the full set of Earth orientation parameters. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, do all the Vigos bands have the same sensitivity in order to be able to compare the intensity to different frequencies? Oh no, they they will not have, and uh, it's uh, it's a uh, yeah, it's actually one of the one of the main problems of the of the system. I would say that at the lower frequencies, uh, besides having less uh, sensitivity, we also have problems with the RFI. So you you have interferences coming from yeah the, the civil use <laughs> civil use of the of the radio bands. Okay, you have lots of inter interferences there, and actually you have higher uh, system temperatures, so lower sensitivities. And also at the higher end, you also have problems. Actually, it's very difficult to have a coherent receiver covering such a wide band because you need what we call phase calls or pulse calls, which are signals that are being sent coherently at, at different frequencies. It's very difficult to have a phase call that has a strong signal covering the whole set of frequencies. So the phase call becomes weak, becomes very weak at the edges of, the, of these bands, at the higher end and at the lower end. It's, it's tricky, it's very tricky. So the sensitivity is not the same. I would say that the optimum, the optimum sensitivity is at the middle. Okay. In C band, it was a C low and C high band. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question. Uh, let's see, with Figos, the bandwidth is wider, two to 14 gigahertz and not distinct like, for example, the SX observations that would have been done in the past. So should the site be RFI protected for the complete two to 14 gigahertz bandwidth or for some specific bandwidths that, that should be free of RFI? How well, that's a very good question. And actually I think, well, uh, the more holes you have in your observation, the more tricky it becomes to calibrate the group delay because you, you could insert ambiguities also in the group delay if you have holes in your frequency coverage. But on the other hand, it means that the, your data rate is, is lower. So, so it's easier to handle all the data you are deriving uh, so, or, or taking from the, from the telescopes. So I think you have to find, or, or, or Vigos has to find a, a good compromise between one and the other. Okay, you, we need a very complete or a, as complete as possible frequency coverage on the one hand, but yeah, then we will have to handle other, other uh, or yeah, the biggest project will have to handle other limitations. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, were source structure effects in 3C84 removed or not? Um, with the three telescopes in the Vigo. Ah, and you mean in this, today. in these uh -huh. plots here, yeah. in these plots here. So effects were uh, so structure effects were modeled. Okay, but this 
this was not done in a, in a, in a, in a standard way, okay? This fringe fitting was not done using a fringe fitting like in Apes or in Casa or the softwares that we are using to do fringe fitting. This was a, a, an in-house developed approach to do fringe fitting that would solve for the source chromaticity at the same time, so in a self-consistent way. Okay, so this is not removed. It's taken into account at the same time as, as, we, as, we, are, as we are deriving the, the, fringe, uh, the fringe quantities. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got a couple of comments here. One is um, that VLBI is the only technique that provides UT1. So that, that makes VLBI um, unique. And another comment is that the KVN um, are working on the pulse count for 129 gigahertz. Do you have any comments on those? I don't know. Maybe somebody in the audience knows about the KVN phase cal implementation? Yeah, that came from um, none other than Richard Dodson, who says that they're they're working on it. They're oh, that's fantastic. Mm. And um, another question. Um, what about prospects for getting maybe even more accurate uh, astrometry done using uh, VLBI with astrometry in space? Do you have any ideas about how that might come about in future? Wow, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea. Of course, VLBI is limited by the size of the Earth, okay? But if we would have a, li a larger Earth <laughs> or we would have enough budget to even build uh, antennas in the moon, for instance, then we would have much higher precision, okay? So the only thing that limits VLBI is our imagination and our budget, I would say. So if you, if you put antennas on space, then this would allow you, and actually there have been antennas in space, VLBI antennas in space. The last, the, la the last mission was Radio Aston, for instance, but you also had the VSOP. So the, the, there have been projects of a space, space VLBI. And the, the, what you get from here, when you measure B times S using a space VLBI, is that you get very high astrometry on the one hand, so very high astrometry and very high spatial resolution for your sources. But on the other hand, you get a very precise uh, model of the, of the orbit of the station. It allows you to even test general relativity, so, so uh, corrections to Newtonian gravitation in the orbit of the of the of the satellite, and also the mass distribution of the Earth. The fact that the Earth is not is not a homogeneous sphere. You can even see the effects of the mountains and, and the oceans and everything. How this uh, mass distribution affects the shape of the orbit of the satellite. So there are other things that you can determine when you have a, a space VLBI station. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's see, let's see, do we have one more question coming in? Just a moment. Uh, another comment coming in. Uh, telescopes on probes orbiting other planets would increase parallaxes by orders of magnitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the problem is that, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dream to have a, a telescope that you can connect coherently to the Earth and that telescope to be in another another planet, but that that, uh, <laughs> that would be tricky. In principle, it would be doable, but of course, uh, the, level, the the budget we would need is astronomical. <laughs> it's not only the, uh, the astronomy would not only be the, the the goal; it would be the budget as well. Budget would be astronomical. <laughs> okay, thanks very much for um, a lovely talk, Ivan. That was that was really enjoyable. Thank you to you. And um, before everybody scurries off. We'd like to remind you about the EVN mini symposium and users meeting coming up next week, uh, Monday to, to Wednesday, July 12th to 14th. Um, the, the website for the symposium is given there on the slide. If you also put in EV, EVN symposium 2021 into your search engine, chances are very good that it will come up. Um, and it's still possible to register. And in fact, registration will stay open throughout the meeting. So we hope that um, that many of you will be there and that you'll enjoy it. And so thank you again.